Good morning, ladies. I'm so excited to have you here this morning. Uh, welcome to everyone who's here in the room with me and all those ladies watching online. Good morning. So uh, let's go ahead and pray, and we will get started. Father, thank you so much for this opportunity that you've given us to come together to study your word. Lord God, we praise you for the truth that we can stand upon, the fact that it is living and active, Lord, and that it cuts through. Um, I pray that you would be with us this morning as we study the context for Ezra. God, I pray that this will make sense and really help to uh, each one of these ladies to dig into your word a little deeper, to become better students of your word. Uh, Lord God, ultimately we seek to magnify and glorify you in all things, so I pray that that's what would happen here this morning. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, Lord God. We love you and praise you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. All right, so last week I had mentioned that we have put this morning Bible study uh, together in a very intentional way. Our goal is to help you become better students of the word. And if you happen to take some time this last week to look at pages six and seven in your study guide, the how-to section, you saw that this involves a three-step process. Observation, seeing what is actually in the text. Interpretation, determining what the meaning of the text is and also application. What do we do with what we've learned? How do we apply it to our lives? Those are the three steps. The observation process basically is you at home going through your study guide, looking at the text, answering who, what, when, where, why, and how questions. The interpretation piece is basically the focus of the teaching time. And then the application part is what you do during your discussion group time together. However, there is one very important step in the process that comes either before observation or as part of the observation process. And that is discovering and determining the context for what you're studying. Consider this drawing by Christophe Borlet. From our vantage point, we can see that it's a, an elephant, right? A whole elephant. We can even observe each little section in light of the whole from our perspective. Now, when it comes to studying the Bible, we must do the very same thing. We must take a few steps back to get a better vantage point of the text so we can observe each part in light of the whole. Only then are we going to be able to see the fullness of God revealed in the text. So let's define context. Context is the circumstances that form the setting for an event, statement, or an idea in terms of which it can be fully understood and assessed. Context is what shapes the meaning and sets the framework for right understanding of the scriptures. If our understanding of the scriptures is limited to what seems right in our own eyes as women living in present day United States of America, we will very likely miss vital details and could potentially walk away misunderstanding God's word thinking, and even believing something that may not even be true about God. We are, most of the time, if we're looking at the text that way, we are operating with only part of the information, just like those people standing, looking at that little square in front of them. Whether we realize it or not, each and every one of us actually comes to the text, approaches it with our own personal framework. We have our own worldview that impacts the way we see, hear, read, and experience things. Our eyes, our ears, our heart, and our mind can actually mislead us 
Remember, the Bible was written by people facing real circumstances. Through the author, God chose to convey a particular message at a particular time in history in a particular, um, to a particular audience. That message never changes, just as God never changes. The author is the one who must determine the meaning of the text, not us. Have you ever had anyone take your words out of context? Maybe something you said, or maybe it was something that you wrote? Or maybe it hasn't happened to you, but you've probably witnessed it happening to somebody else. It could end up being a situation that you just kind of laugh off and think, okay, that was just a minor (laughs) misunderstanding. But sometimes there can be devastating consequences. What's at stake if we misunderstand the word of God? We risk missing the point of the text And if we miss the point of the text, we can end up misleading ourselves or misleading others. We also risk missing God in the text, diminishing him instead of magnifying him as the text is meant to do. As we study God's word, we want to ensure that we understand it rightly, that we receive the message that he intended to give to us so that we can then rightly apply it to our lives. That's the order in the process. We need to set ourselves up for success when we study God's word. And so we can do that when we study scripture through three lenses. So I want you to imagine a telescope. A telescope magnifies a distant object, right? It brings it into clear view. A telescope allows us to see what we could not see with our human eyes. Uh, I was actually, as I was putting this together, I, I actually looked up an article on NASA website, the Hubble Telescope website, and it says that telescopes allow us to see more because their mirrors and lenses can collect more light than the human eye can collect on its own. To create a clear image, telescope lenses and mirrors bring light rays to meet at a single point, the focal point. I think it's so cool because in the same way, studying scripture through these three lenses of context will magnify God and it will bring the author's intended meaning into focus, because that's what we're trying to get to. So these three lenses, literary context, historical context, and biblical context. Literary context is the words around the text. Historical context is the world around the text. And biblical context is how the rest of God's word connects to the text that you're studying. So let's talk a little bit about the literary context first. The surrounding verses always provide details that help us better understand what the author intended to communicate to the original audience. Whether you're studying one verse, one chapter, one book, to determine the literary context, you need to look at the verses immediately before and immediately after. That's going to help you fully understand what is being said in the right context. So we must look at a verse in light of the paragraph that it's sitting in. And then you look at a paragraph in light of the chapter that it's sitting in. And if you're studying a whole chapter at a time, you need to look at that chapter in light of the whole book. And if, like we're doing today, we're talking about the whole book of Ezra as a whole, you need to look at the book of Ezra in light of the books that are surrounding it, and also in light of all of Scripture. It's so important. Remember, the Bible is intelligently designed 
it's not exactly chronological, but it is put together in a very intentional way. Studying the context provides opportunities for us to marvel at the divine author of Scripture. For example, this week you studied 2 Chronicles 36, which is the book right before Ezra 1, and you studied Nehemiah 1, which is the book right at the end of Nehemiah, the first chapter, right after Ezra 10. These two chapters help provide significant details that will help us study the book of Ezra from here on out with the eyes of the original audience. You may not find quite as much information when you study other books this way, but you will always glean something if you take time to do this one step. Just look at the verses or one chapter before and one chapter after. Another part of the literary context is determining the genre and figuring out who the author and the original audience of the text is. The Bible contains many different types of genres, uh, poetry, wisdom, epistles, prophecy, law, apocalyptic literature. What we need to remember is that the genre tells us how to read the text. We would not read and interpret a Psalm of David the same way that we would Paul's letters, right? Likewise, we would not read and interpret a narrative, a story, in the same way that we read and interpret prophecy. They each have their own rules, so it's important to remember that. So what's the best way to identify the genre and determine the author and the audience? Well, the best way is to read the whole book that you're studying. And sometimes that's not possible to just sit down and read the whole thing. If you're studying Genesis, that's going to take you a while, right? So what can we do? Well, you can refer to a study Bible or a Bible dictionary, and they all have introductory information that precede the book, and you can get the information from there. Now, that shouldn't substitute for you actually taking the time to read through the text. In fact, um, Ezra this year, this uh, semester, is 10 chapters. We studied 1 Timothy last time. That was six chapters. So that was a 15-minute read, so we had you doing that every single week. This time, we've broken up Ezra in half. So every week, you're going to be reading half of Ezra. And so you will end up reading through the text like five times before the end of this semester because we want you to study the part in light of the whole. All right. So historical... Uh, some details about Ezra. Next slide. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Ezra is a historical narrative, and I figured that out by, by reading it, right? Though it also includes some interesting things. There are proclamations, letters, lists, and genealogies. But still, Ezra essentially reads like a story. The author. Okay, so According to Jewish tradition and Christian tradition, the author of Ezra, and actually Ezra Nehemiah, which as I noted in your study guide, is considered, or originally was, one work. It's believed that Ezra the scribe is the one who wrote it, but we can't say that with 100% certainty because the author never actually reveals themselves in the text. And the original audience. The original audience for the book of Ezra is the post-exilic remnant of God's people. The remaining people who came back from exile in Jerusalem and in the surrounding areas, right? So, historical context. Emily Kurtz wrote, God's people were affected by history, and history was affected by God's people. This weaving of history with the events of the Bible is a crucial piece of the puzzle. Every word of the Bible was written at a certain point in history in the midst of a certain set of circumstances. So to determine the historical context, we should ask some questions. What are the major issues of the day for that 
original audience. What prompted the writing of this text? What was the occasion for the writing of the text? What's the spiritual climate in that time? Is it a time of faithfulness or faithlessness? And what about the political climate? Though there are many fantastic resources written by biblical scholars and historians, the absolute best resource for the historical context is the Bible, right? We can often identify the cultural and the historical atmosphere of a book from looking in the Bible. Um, we can look within the book itself as we're reading and determine information. And we can also look at other books of the Bible to get that kind of information, just like we did this week. We can look at books that were written by the same author you can look at books that were written at the same time period. There are some of the uh, prophets that were written at this same time period, and they overlap, and you can read those to glean some information. Um, you could also read books or passages that are referencing uh, the same issue that's being discussed. You can use cross-references. They are very helpful if you want to look up information about specific people, places, or even themes in Scripture. Just look at the cross-references. And biblical context, how the rest of God's word connects to the text that you're studying. The best way to determine the biblical context is to know your Bible. That's, <laughs> there's no shortcut. You have to know your Bible. So it's important that even though we're studying, that you are also regularly setting aside time to read God's word because you need to know what it says. And as you do, things will begin to click. When you're reading a particular passage, you'll remember, oh, I read something about this here. And then you can flip yourself. That's how you learn. Biblical context connects major biblical themes with the grand narrative, the big story of the Bible. God at work in Jesus Christ, reconciling humanity back to himself. So let's look at this next slide. We spent week number one kind of pulling back and looking at this sort of airplane view of the story of the Bible. If you'll see, notice the red on there, that's where Ezra fits in on that timeline. I went ahead and put that in for you, just so you can see visually where it is. Um, obviously, it's before the time of Christ, but it's after the, the covenant and the promises of Moses and all that. And if you see the little line that comes out with the X to the right, that is an indication of when the kingdoms divided. There was a northern kingdom and southern kingdom. So that X is actually when the Assyrians came in and took over, and I've got that date marked for you up there as well. So now what we're going to do is we're going to zoom in and look closely at the passages that we looked at this week. So instead of just writing a synopsis of the historical and biblical context, we wanted to give you the opportunity to kind of practice this step. And so you got to read several passages of scripture to build the foundation for our study of Ezra. And these details that we're going to discuss are all going to ultimately help you to magnify God in the text and bring the author's intended meaning into focus as you study. Okay, so let's read 2 Chronicles 36, 1 through 16. 2 Chronicles 36. The people of the land took Jehoahaz, the son of Josiah, and made him king in his father's place in Jerusalem. Jehoahaz was 23 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned three months in Jerusalem. Then the king of Egypt deposed him in Jerusalem and laid on the land a tribute of a hundred talents of silver and a talent of gold. And the king of Egypt made Eliakim his brother king over Judah and Jerusalem and changed his name to Jehoiakim. But Necho took Jehoahaz his brother and carried him to Egypt. Egypt. 
Jehoiakim was 25 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. He did what was evil in the sight of the Lord his God. Against him came up Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and bound him in chains to take him to Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar also carried part of the vessels of the house of the Lord to Babylon and put them in his palace in Babylon. Now the rest of the acts of Jehoiakim and the abominations that he did and what was found against him, behold, they are written in the book of the kings of Israel and Judah. And Jehoiachin, his son, reigned in his place. Jehoiachin was 18 years old when he became king, and he reigned three months and ten days in Jerusalem. He did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. In the spring of the year, King Nebuchadnezzar sent and brought him to Babylon with the precious vessels of the house of the Lord and made his brother brother Zedekiah king over Judah and Jerusalem. Zedekiah was 21 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. He did what was evil in the sight of the Lord his God. He did not humble himself before Jeremiah the prophet, who spoke from the mouth of the Lord. He also rebelled against King Nebuchadnezzar, who had made him swear by God. He stiffened his neck and hardened his heart against turning to the Lord, the God of Israel. All the officers of the priests and the people likewise were exceedingly unfaithful, following all the abominations of the nations, and they polluted the house of the Lord that he had made holy in Jerusalem. The Lord, the God of their father, sent persistently to them by his messengers because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. But they kept mocking the messengers of God, despising his words and scoffing at his prophets until the wrath of the Lord rose against his people until there was no remedy. So the first thing we're going to look at is disobedience. Josiah was the last godly king of Judah. Chapter 36 begins with Jehoahaz becoming king, not by God's appointment, but by popular demand by the people. Josiah was not the eldest son, and that's normally who would succeed the father. The king set the pattern for life, for good or for ill. The last three kings of Judah, it says in the text, did what was evil in the sight of the Lord their God. They were arrogant, rebellious, stiff-necked, and exceedingly unfaithful. They stubbornly followed their hardened, evil hearts. This is all the more shocking when we consider the fact that not only was the king supposed to be faithful to God, but they were supposed to lead the people toward the same faithfulness to God. They were meant to function as a mediator. Deuteronomy 17 I thought it would be helpful to look at this passage. So Deuteronomy 17, 14, 15, and then 18 through 20 is what I'm going to read. God says this, When you come to the land that the Lord your God is giving you, and you possess it and dwell in it, and then say, I will set a king over me like all the nations that are around me, you may indeed set a king over you whom the Lord your God will choose. One from among your brothers you shall set as king over you. And when he sets the kingdom, he shall write for himself in a book a copy of this law approved by the Levitical priests. And it shall be with him, and he shall read in it all the days of his life that he may learn to fear the Lord his God by keeping all the words of this law and these statutes and doing them, that his heart may not be lifted up above his brothers and that he may not turn aside from the commandment either to the right or the left so that he may continue long in his kingdom 
he and his children in Israel. That's what a king is supposed to do. In addition, as Dr. David Samara writes, the king is to be subject to the word of God as conveyed through the prophets. In other words, obedience to the word of God is the necessary condition for a king to be acceptable to the God of Israel. John Walton and Andrew Hill wrote, people commonly think of prophets as those who utter mysterious predictions about the future. But one problem with this view is that it obscures the role of God. According to the scriptures, prophets received and proclaimed the very words of God. Prophets communicated God's perspective and God's plan, not their own. God called the prophets to speak everything he commanded, but his people did not listen. Uh, This was interesting. So I came across Jeremiah 36 this week studying. This is an example of the extreme ungodliness of Jehoiakim. He received a scroll from the prophet Jeremiah. Instead of humbling himself, because within it contained a warning about him needing to turn and change his ways. So instead of humbling himself and even tearing his clothes and fearing the Lord, he had the audacity to, as the words are being read, cut the pieces of the scroll and throw them in the fire. Just burning it up. Did not even care. Well, It wasn't long before another scroll came from Jeremiah, and this is what it said. Therefore, thus says the Lord concerning Jehoiakim, king of Judah, he shall have none to sit on the throne of David, and his body shall be cast out to the heat by day and the frost by night. And I will punish him and his offspring and his servants for their iniquity. I will bring upon them and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and upon the people of Judah, all the disaster that I have pronounced against him. But they would not hear. Lest we think that the punishment, the exile, is too harsh, let's remember that God had compassion on his people. He sent the prophets over and over to warn them to turn from their sin and turn to the Lord to repent and have faith and be obedient. And every time they rejected God's message and God's messengers, every time. Even as you noticed in the text this week, the priests, the priests and the people were exceedingly unfaithful, not just unfaithful, exceedingly unfaithful. They, it actually says, God is saying, they polluted the house of the Lord that he made holy in Jerusalem. Think about that. Faithlessness, disobedience, idolatry, and outright rebellion against God led them to this place. And it cost them greatly. Let's read verses 17 through 21 in chapter 36. Therefore, he brought up against them the king of the Chaldeans, who killed their young men with the sword in the house of their sanctuary, and had no compassion on young man or virgin, old man or aged. He gave them all into his hand. And all the vessels of the house of God, great and small, and the treasures of the house of the Lord, and the treasures of the king and his princes, all these he brought to Babylon. And they burned the house of God and broke down the wall of Jerusalem and burned all its palaces with fire and destroyed all its precious vessels. He took into exile in Babylon those who had escaped from the sword. And they became servants to him and to his sons until the establishment of the kingdom of Persia. 
to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed its Sabbaths. All the days that it lay desolate, it kept Sabbath to fulfill 70 years. Now, they started with disobedience and now they're experiencing complete dishonor. Remember, God chose Jerusalem. Second Chronicles 6, 6 says, he chose it that his name may be there. Jerusalem was, as Psalm 132, 5 says, a dwelling place for the mighty one of Jacob. Now, God tur- turns Judah over. He turns it over to one who will have no compassion for his people. The fall of Jerusalem actually occurs in three waves. This is so interesting. Just as there were three waves of exilers returning to Jerusalem, there were three waves when they actually were deported. First in 605 BC, Nebuchadnezzar, that's when he first initially subjected uh, Jerusalem to his power and control. And then in 597 BC, he sends his main, like, big army, and they come and siege Jerusalem and take people. And then in 586 BC, that's when he completely destroys Jerusalem and deports the people. Those who escaped the sword became servants. But we know that some of them actually gained favor and status Think about Nehemiah and Daniel. Nothing in Jerusalem was spared, including the great temple that Solomon had built. This temple was the physical symbol of God's presence in their midst. It was the place of fellowship with God, and it's gone. The Babylonians actually desecrated the temple before they burned it. They feasted within it for two days. And on the third day, they set it on fire and carried away all of its treasures to Babylon. They broke down the wall of Jerusalem, the physical security of the city. The sins of Judah cost them greatly. They lost the Hebrew monarchy, They lost their city, their place of worship, their homes, countless lives, and the unimaginable separated, not just from their people, but separated from God. Clark writes, thus ends the history of a people, the most fickle, the most ungrateful, and perhaps on the whole, the most sinful that ever existed on the face of the earth. But what a display does all this give of the power, justice, mercy, and long-suffering of the Lord. There was no people like this people, and there is no God like their God. Selman writes, in the end, the exile came not because Israel sinned, but because they spurned God's offer of reconciliation. Think about that. They spurned God's offer of reconciliation. These were God's chosen people, meant to be set apart and holy to the Lord. They refused God's mercy and grace. The story could have ended there, but it didn't. Let's look at verses 22 and 23. Now, when the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing. Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever is among you of all his people, 
May the Lord his God be with him. Let him go up. What? God is faithful, even when his people are faithless. True to his word, God begins to bring his people back to the promised land. I'm sure you noted that these two verses are almost identical to verses 1 through 3 in Ezra chapter 1. We'll look at this passage in more detail next week, but I feel like I can't move on to Nehemiah 1 without acknowledging this contrast between Cyrus, king of Persia, this pagan king, and the disobedient, evil, hard-hearted kings of Judah. This pagan king declared that the Lord is the God of heaven. He rightly acknowledged that it is by the hand of God that he acquired the kingdoms of the earth. He even gives the people of God his blessing to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild the house of God. This is yet another testimony of something that only God could do. Only God could do this. This is where the book of Ezra begins. Just as there were three waves of deportation, like I said, into the exile, the people returned in three waves. In 538 BC, they were led by Zerubbabel. And then in 458 BC, they were led by Ezra. These two waves are what are covered in the book of Ezra. And then the third wave came in 445 BC. And this is the group led by Nehemiah that's covered in the book of Nehemiah. Scholars refer to this as a second exodus. And according to John MacArthur, there are many similarities to the original exodus from slavery in Egypt. Um, They include the rebuilding of the temple and the city walls. So after the the first exodus, the temple and the walls were built. Uh, The reinstitution of the law. If you'll remember when the people were with Moses at Mount Sinai, they received the law. The challenge of local enemies happened in both. The temptation to intermarry with non-Jews that resulted in idolatry happened in both cases. The returnees must have felt like God had given them a fresh start. And boy, did they need one. More than 90 years actually passed between the first wave at the beginning of Ezra and chapter 1 of Nehemiah. There's a like 93 years, I believe, span between the two. The wall of Jerusalem and its gates remained in a heap all that time because the people of the land continually frustrated the purpose of God's people. Nehemiah understood what the city of Jerusalem represented to God and to God's people. The news of what's happened actually breaks him. Let's read Nehemiah 1. We'll start at verse 4. As soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days, and I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And I said, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant that I now pray before you, day and night for the people of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which we have sinned against you. Even I and my father's house have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, and the rules that you commanded your servant Moses. Remember the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, Though your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven, 
From there I will gather them and bring them to the place that I have chosen to make my name dwell there. They are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. O oh Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name and give success to your servant today and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. Now I was a cupbearer to the king. Nehemiah's prayer reveals his unwavering hope in the Lord. Verse 5, he says, God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. Humble and contrite, he confesses and intercedes for the people of God because he knows the character of God and he trusts in his faithfulness. Nehemiah asked the Lord to remember his word, his promise to gather his people and bring them back to the place in which he chose to make his name dwell. So often in the scriptures, we see God's promises and the way that they bring comfort and encouragement and hope to God's people, especially in those moments when they feel like they've gone too far or they need to be too far gone. This is the case with Jeremiah 29. I had you look at that this week in your study. God encouraged his people with his word at their absolute lowest point. And he tells them to live. He calls them to stand apart and be his people in this foreign land, to pray and to seek the welfare of this foreign land in which they're living. And he says that when the time comes, he will restore them. Let's look at this. Jeremiah 29, 10, 11, and 14. For thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed, I will visit you and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare and not for evil to give you a future and a hope. I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. Think about this for a minute. So the Holman Illustrated Bible Dictionary says that the prophets were not all knowing, but all telling. They spoke what God told them to speak. Biblical prophecy has a progressive character, and often it has more than one fulfillment. There is usually an immediate application within the context that it's written, and there's usually a future application to another context. In fact, the New Testament authors believed Old Testament events, persons, or things all foreshadowed New Testament realities in Jesus Christ. So let's read this again. For I know the plans I have for you, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. Is this not what God is doing in Christ? Sorry, I get excited about this. Remember, from the beginning, God sovereignly planned to create a people for himself, living in the place that he created for them, living in right relationship with him. The means for achieving that, I told you last week, and it's still true, 
It was Jesus. Like Israel, Adam and Eve enjoyed life in the presence of God. Yet as a result of their sinful rebellion, God cast Adam and Eve out of the garden, exiling them from the place God chose for them to dwell in his presence. Yet all was not lost. There was hope. God promised that Eve's offspring would crush the head of the serpent and deliver mankind from slavery to sin, restoring right relationship with God. In Christ, God provides freedom from eternal exile and the opportunity for spiritual exodus right now. Full consummation of his purpose will come when Christ returns. Our great God extended covenant, loving kindness, grace, and mercy to the people of Israel. And in Christ, God extends the fullness of his loving kindness and grace to us. The atonement was more than just Jesus dying on the cross for our sins. Jesus was fully God and fully man. Thus, Jesus is God doing something as human for mankind. Where mankind failed over and over, Jesus succeeded. He did what we could not do for ourselves. Jesus lived a life in perfect obedience to the Father. Like the first Adam, Jesus was faced with a decision before a tree. The first Adam said, my will be done. The second Adam says, thy will be done. Jesus is God saving humanity that we may vicariously be made right with God through him, in him, in Christ. That's what it means to be in Christ. His humanity becomes ours when we repent and place our trust in him. Romans 5.18 says, Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. But, sadly, those who are not in Christ are in exile and will remain in exile, eternally separated from God forever. But, as long as we draw breath, there is still hope, and God doesn't give up on us. But we have to choose. He's not going to force us to do it. Have you heard people say things about the God of the Old Testament, how he's angry and mean, or, you know, they think less of him because of what he told the Israelites to do when they came into the promised land. Or, you know, sending them off into exile. Guess what? Those people are reading out of context. Because if they read the Bible in context, it would not diminish God in that way. They would be humbled and in awe and filled with wonder at what God has done and his patience and long-suffering with his people, even us today. What we saw this week in the text, that is our God magnified in full view for us to see. This is what happens when we study in context. For me, it goes beyond just enjoying Bible study. This is... This is delight. This is joy and wonder that we can be filled with as we begin to see God in his fullness in the text of Scripture. That's my motivation. I get to know him and that I love him more, and man, I hope that the same thing happens for you as you're studying. I guarantee you, it's never going to stop. If you pick up Ezra again one year from now, and then again a year after that, I guarantee you, you're going to learn something new about God, and you're going to love him even more. It doesn't seem possible, but it is. Trust me. His word is alive and active. Let it have its way. Let him have his way in you through his word. Over the next 10 weeks, every time you sit down to begin your Bible study, Pray, 
and remember the things that we've learned this week. Take a few steps back to get a vantage point of the text. Observe each part in light of the whole. Remember the telescope. Put yourself in the shoes of the original audience in that post-exilic time in Jerusalem. Studying the scriptures will magnify God and bring the author's intended meaning into focus if we study it in context. Let's pray. Father, I don't even know what to say. God, we are not worthy. Oh, Lord. I pray that if there is any wicked way in us, Lord, that you would just make it known, and God, help us. Forgive us. We confess. We are not always the people that you want us to be, Lord. But you don't call us to do it alone. We have you. We have each other. We have your word that just evidences your character completely, perfectly. God, transform us. I pray over the next 10 weeks as we continue and really dive into our study of Ezra, God, I pray that as these women faithfully open your word, Lord, you would meet them there, bless their time, and help them to see who you really are. God, we love you and praise you. In Christ's name, amen.